for the, um, the show. My kids bought up. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Marek Kach, and we have presenting here today Vandana Saproy and Fiona um, Gibson, who will join us in a moment. Um, although I have just removed the. Where is she? Sorry, guys. I can't see Fiona anymore. I'm here. I, I know I can hear you, you but, but okay, well, we will just have to listen to you, but we can't see you. Um, I've lost the, um, the video on the screen, but that's fine. We know what you would like. <laughs> All right. So today I'm going to talk about flies. Now, has anyone here ever eaten fly? A snack? Other insects? So we're teaching them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So why not? Is it disease? Disease? Maybe fear of disease? Or a bit of taste. Maybe it's a bit. <laughs> oh, my, it could be. Maybe it's a bit yuck. The idea of eating flies. How about food that are grown on flies? Would that be okay? Yeah, maybe. So we started this project um, thinking that people might have an emotional reaction when they buy food that is grown on fly poo. This project is about turning fly poo into useful products. And the flies in this case are reared on agricultural waste, livestock waste, so manure. Is frass the actual word? I will get there. Oh. So this is a pretty big project. It is um, a couple of million supported by many industry partners. The leader of the project is Australian Pork. The industry partner is Future Green Solutions. That's the actual fly farm. And uh, the Department of Agriculture and Fisheries in Queensland is um, also involved in a research capacity. And we have these various um, research and development corporations helping us and, and, and benefiting from this project. Hopefully the Australian needs processes, Australian eggs, AgriFutures, Dairy Australia, and the Fish Research and Development Corporation. And many researchers involved as well. This is a truly interdisciplinary study, right? So we have Sasha Jenkins, he's, he's the leader of the project, together with uh, Ian Wake and Jen Middleton, looking at soil microbiology and how the soil responds to, um, to fresh, which I'll get to in a moment. Megan, Ryan, with her team, Daniel Pitt, Joe Walker, and um, Soon is a PhD student, um, working on crop growth using press. Then we have Andrew Gazzoni and his team, Andrew Young, and I think there's someone else working with him as well. They're the engineering team. And then we have the socioeconomics um, component, which involves myself, Fiona, Vandana, and Audrey, uh, and also Audrey, who you may have seen in the corridors. She's going to start a PhD with us in a couple of months' time. So, industry partners is Luke Wheat the, from Future Green Solutions and Sophia Katzin. They were at the Black Soldier Fly Farm up in Shenton Park. Luke is the owner. And we have David Cook from the WA Department of, um, uh, of Agriculture, say. Uh, he's the entomologist. He has a role in the project. And Matt, that should be Matt Deegan, uh, working for the Queensland Department of Agriculture. And it has um, a lot of so a lot of different disciplines, a lot of different objectives. The first, firstly, we want to use black soldier fly to provide an alternative to storing manure on the land or, or processing it in, um, into compost. So it's a it's a livestock waste processing pro, um, um, technology that we are looking to develop, and that's mostly Luke and his team. So. Before I continue with the other objectives, a little bit about black soldier flies. Black soldier flies are a really interesting little fly. They only live a couple of days, 10, I think, at most. We see the photo on the slide. And they don't have any mouth, the mouth parts. They don't eat. And therefore, they can't spread diseases or pests. They are not a pest. They're, um, they're pretty innocent little flies, really. Um, no little, but big. 
maybe centimeter or two maximum. But the useful thing of this fly is uh, their larvae, larvae, so their eggs and their larvae. So the larvae are the phase of throughout the, the fly's lifespan that does eat, and you see that on the second image. They're larvae that eat pretty much anything. They're like mini goats. They would eat. They will eat anything that you give them. And I think they're even looking into using using them to convert plastic. So in this pro, uh, project, we're looking at feeding them waste and carcasses, and mules. And there's also pro work going on feeding these flies um, food waste and and using the larvae and their sheddings. So that's the, it's just like snake, they shed their skin as they grow and that uh, skin is called castings. And that's, um, and when you grind that up, it's called fresh. So that's what Steve referred to before. And we are looking at the fresh, so the castings of, that, of those flies and the larvae and whether we can develop that into a useful product. We can't use it as a feed product because it's being fed on animals. So we're going to look at whether we can potentially use it as a soil improver or a fertilizer or maybe some other product. That's what the whole project is about. And in the first stage, it has really all been about Luke and his team optimizing the conditions for these flies to grow and capturing that, that product, which you can see here on the, the bottom photo. I'll go through the other three objectives very quickly. Um, what we then do is we're, going, we're investigating, this is all the biophysical team with Megan and, and Sasha and teams looking at the effects of that fresh and the larvae on, on different aspects of soil biology and leaching and soil constraints and also on plant growth. So we're looking at whether adding this product to the soil can increase yield, crop yield. We then have an engineering component look, that is trying to turn this powdery substance that we have here into a fertilizer product um, that, we, that farmers can use, uh, looking at uh, granules and pellets. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment. And then we have the socioeconomic component looking at adoption potential for farmers to adopt this fertilizer that we, that we want to develop as an actual product in the market. So very briefly in two slides, I wanna tell you about the biophysical research, just because it's so interesting and it's taken us several years to get here. So we have everyone up over there in the soil science building um, doing uh, pot trials on different sort of crops and see how they respond. So we have, we've had um, pasture crops, wheat crops, horticulture, you can see the, the lettuces there. And what they do is they, um, they add different concentrations of fresh to the soil, mix the soil, and then plant those, those crops. And uh, what you see here, uh, it's most uh, clear in this lettuce experiment. This would be synthetic fertilizer. You can see that the lettuce has grown um, quite big. Um, this is, I think, pure urea, and this is the BSF fresh. Um, doesn't work as well as synthetic fertilizer, but it does add a little bit of extra nutrients to the soil. We're currently, um, the photo at the bottom is a field trial that we just put in about two weeks ago, um, and they're still working on that. That is going in, in um, Shenton Park. So this is Joanne adding the, the, fry, the, the fly powder to the soil. And then there's also leaching experiments going on looking at whether that fresh can um, capture some nitrous oxide in the soil to, re to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Just a quick preview on what we're actually finding is that, um, as you can see in the photo as well, the fresh doesn't work as well as a synthetic fertilizer, but it does bind carbon in the soil and it reduces emissions. So most likely this product is going to be um, interesting to either maybe organic farmers who want to use it as an organic supplement and don't want to use synthetic fertilizer or as a, um, a soil uh, amelioration product. 
because it has high carbon content. Engineering is the other component. They're doing lots of work directly with, um, with Luke at um, turning that press into usable product. Uh, using different types of machines, they're doing they're sieving the product to see if different components have higher nutrient contact uh, content, and they're um, they're evaluating the, per the performance of these different size pellets and different fractions of fresh versus larvae, and they're also doing this um, what's called ballistic modeling. I had no idea what that meant when we started this, but it means they're um, they're modeling how well the product handles if you put it in the machine, how well does it spread. Because you know that we don't do it by hand anymore. It's just in practice. And I think that's where Fiona comes in. Your turn, Fiona. Great, thanks, Marit. So, as Marit mentioned, our team's working on the socio-economic research component for the project. Um, we've got quite a few things that we're working on. Um, so the first one is to um, is look at where is the waste um, distributed throughout the study area, which is the southern um, part of Australia, um, for what industries um, and what sort of volumes are available um, for, you know, a potential siting of, of one or many black soldier fly facilities, um, I guess with the idea that um, the waste needs to be available within a certain distance to make it economical um, to be able to um, to be able to use it in the facility. So Audrey um, last year has done a, a lot of work on this um, part of the project um, with assistance from me. Um, the second um, part of the project is what we're working on at the moment. Um, so it's looking. So we're looking at so first for the potential users of the black soldier fly facility so the the people the industries that are producing waste um, what is the likely adoption um, of, of these people actually switching from what they currently do to disposing delivering their waste to black soldier fly facility and what is the potential um, for um for pay, are, are they are they willing to pay to do that or do they require compensation um, to, to switch them from what they're currently doing. And I'll talk a little bit more about the complexities of, um, of waste disposal and costs um, in, in, this, in, in this area, a bit in the next slide. Um, and then the second aspect is looking at, um, so the potential end users of the product, um, the crops and um, pasture farmers. Um, so um, what is their, likely you know likeliness to adopt the product like the end product and how much would they be willing to pay um, to to use this product and that work is being well we're all working on that so Vandana, Audrey, Marit and myself. Um, the next bit is about um, is about identifying uh, waste producers and also the end users um, attitudes and their emotional response to um, to either using the black soldier fly facility for waste disposal or potentially using the products. And this is quite a key, um, key part of the project to really understand if there is an emotional um, kind of like a disgust um, barrier to, to utilising this, this new um, technology and product. Um, uh, we're also looking at um, just more broadly identifying benefits and costs in, of insect farming. Uh, and also um, more broadly looking at the uh, the costs um, with current uh, waste management practices. Uh, that's uh, myself, Audrey and Marit. Um, and then the last bit, um, which we haven't, well, Fiona has done a little bit of work on this aspect of the project, but it's looking at the market potential um, for products. Okay. Oh, Marit, could you, thank you. So I'll just talk a bit about, um, so because this was a big chunk of work that we did last year. Um, so really looking at whereabouts in Australia, um, the waste is, um, is produced. So we utilised um, an industry database called the Australian Renewable Energy Mapping Infrastructure Database. Um, 
um, so we use that to, um, and, and then you know, exported data out of that system um, into our own um, GIS map. So Audrey uh, very quickly learned some GIS skills with that, with the help of Cheryl, which was fantastic. Um, and just an example down the bottom there is um, a map um, illustrating where the um, where the piggery waste is um, is located. That's in sort of dry tons per year. Um, and then on the right hand side, um, just to demonstrate there, we've got a table. Um, so by state and by industry, where the um, where the waste is, um, or how how much I guess volume of yeah dry tons per year um, is produced in each industry in each state. Um, as you can probably see, Queensland produce a lot of animal waste. Um, so we. Uh, they are by far the largest producer of poultry waste. Um, and uh, what else is in there? Dairy, uh, dairy waste is predominantly in Victoria. Um, but I guess, yeah, overall, Victoria, New South Wales and South Australia. Oh, sorry, Victoria, New South Wales and Queensland um, produce, yeah, probably the bulk of the waste uh, with um, contributions from some of the other states. Um, so that was a good exercise to, to go through. Um, some of the data gaps that um, Audrey uh, came across, um, as you can see there, there, there is for some of the meat processing, um, uh, there is no data available for some of those states. Um, so yeah, that was difficult to, to get hold of um, some of that data. Um, there's also um, a lot of inconsistencies in the spatial scale of the data. Um, so some some was given at like a, as an um, LGA area and others in like a statistical area too. So trying to make sure that we didn't you know do any double counting um, that was yeah quite a fairly large process to go through. Um, there also wasn't a lot of information on the methods um, that were used to calculate the waste volumes that that are um, that are recorded in this Aremi database. Um, so we were a little bit unsure about the accuracy of the data, um, especially given that we know through, um, for the, through the literature that we looked at um, when we first started the project, that there are quite significant differences in the amount of waste that is produced with, um, with different types of management practices. So for example, in the pig, piggery industry, um, a conventional um, piggery versus a deep litter piggery, um, yeah, get different um, different waste volumes that are available from those different types of systems. Uh, right, uh, next slide, thanks, Marich. It might be worth stressing why we did this um, waste mapping exercise, Fiona. Yeah, well, yeah, just as I, I, yeah, I think, um, so to, to really give the project team an idea on where the most, um, I guess, uh, cost efficient Place is to site a um, black soldier fly facility. So the next, um, so what we've been working on at the moment um, is um, collecting data on waste disposal costs, um, uh, willingness to pay, um, and also the perception data around the attitudes and the emotional response. Um, so these surveys um, that Audrey and I are working on are, are being shortly to be distributed to waste producers um, via our industry partners. So um, we're collecting information on the types of waste, whether it you know, be manures um, or like spent bedding, for example, like in um, poultry industry, like straw, that kind of stuff. Um, and the, the volumes of that's just to be able to provide, I guess, a bit more um, information to complement the spatial analysis that we did last year using the Aremi data set. Um, different, what are the different types of management practices? Um, the cost types of waste management, so labour, um, infrastructure, etc., cetera, um, and the amounts, like how much they are. Um, potential adoption um, of um, using um, black soldier fly facility for waste disposal and the likely barriers to adoption and then the emotions and attitudes um, towards this type of technology. 
So it's quite a technical survey. Um, and yeah, and I guess, I guess like it's, it's difficult to design um, questions to suit each of the industry types. So, you know, across piggery, dairy, poultry, um, meat processing. Um, yeah, it's been quite it's been quite difficult to not just end up with um, four or five different surveys for each industry. Um, so it's, yeah, it's been quite a skill there, making sure we don't have too complicated a survey. Um, the other aspect um, that's been a challenge has been uh, the different types of, uh, the different ways in which producers measure costs, uh, whether it be per ton um, or, as a part of, um, you know, just like their whole farm management system. Um, and it's quite variable between industries, but also between individual farmers. Uh, so it just even being able to identify um, the cost of waste disposal has been a challenge as everybody does it differently. Um, and there's lots of little backhanded deals, I guess. So, um, you know, a piggery farmer who might um, provide his waste to a neighbour, for example, um, where the neighbour might pay for the freight or in other cases the farmer will pay for the freight. It's quite, yeah, it's difficult and um, variable. So that's been a challenge. Um, and then the non-market costs um, as well, because I guess a lot of the producers that we spoke to during the interviews um, weren't yeah, quite sure, you know, about um, what the costs were, um, they didn't really necessarily affect them. Um, so that was um, difficult. And then just being able to define um, the bounds for the willingness to pay or the willingness to accept big questions. Um, it was quite a challenge um, just because of what I mentioned before. Like it's just very difficult to identify and, and specify the status quo because everybody has a different status quo. So um, yeah, that's been challenging. So yes, as I mentioned, the next steps to distribute the survey um, in the coming um, few weeks, and that'll be out to a national group. So it's nerve wracking, but exciting at the same time. Um, so on the next slide, thanks. And I just thought I'd put in some lessons that we've learned along the way, because it's been a really interesting um, project and uh, set of research activities. Um, I think what was, yeah, what was really important was doing the interviews with the waste producers really early. Um, to un so we really understood the different types of waste management systems um, that there are. Um, and Audrey and I, yeah, had to have particularly Audrey, quite a technique, quite an in-depth knowledge of how waste management and disposal works on a farm. Um, yet to be able to design this survey um, and collect useful information. Um, so I'm really glad that we, the milestones were structured in a way that this was one of the first things that we did. Um, and that we also did quite an extensive um, set of interviews, yeah. Um, the second one um, was, I, I mean, I, I guess I, coming from a farming background, I'm well aware of this point, but to, re, um, to let others know that um, producers and farmers really are experts in their production system. They have a really high level of technical knowledge. Uh, and that's, um, I guess that's, um, when we're designing the survey, that's given us the confidence to make it a bit more technical than what we normally would do for just us kind of standard um, public um, consumer-based surveys. Um, but that's also yeah, been quite challenging because as a survey designer, you've had, you have need to have a really in-depth understanding of the production system. And then the last point there, um, I just wanted to make, because uh, this has been um, a really great insight for me. I've, I've certainly, this has been a learning for me. Um, so I just, yeah, I think that the surveys have really not just been about data collection. Um, it's very much been about identifying new project partners through the various people that we've spoken to through structured interviews. Um, we've found that our research has been actually informing the science decisions around, you know, what, um, 
what things are growing in the pots, like how the um, how the fertilizer you know is produced, and like some of the limitations um, for the the facility, but also the product, um, and that's been really exciting. Um, and also that um, through this the structured interviews, we're actually finding that we're we're educating people on this new technology, and people are really interested in it, and they want to know more. And unfortunately, I, Audrey and I can't can't answer their questions in the interviews because um, we're, we're certainly not the science experts. But yeah, a lot of people really wanted technical scientific information about how this process works. So that's been really great to be able to put them in touch with the scientists so they can learn more. I think that's it, Merit, from me. I think we'll move on to Van Dunner next. Thank you, Fiona. No, you have to use the mouse. I don't know. Why. You just scroll down. Just scroll down. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, Fiona. Thank you, Marit. So uh, I'll be talking about end user preferences in the survey and our progress to the date and the challenges. Now, the purpose of um, identifying end user or, or um, my, uh, my role in this uh, project is to basically um, work on the end user survey. And the purpose is to identify potential end users of BSF RAS products. Not only that, it is to identify their preferences and their willingness to pay for BSF RAS products across farming systems. And this is to inform product development. And the way we went about uh, developing the end user survey was through structured interviews and focus groups with the uh, farmers across different production systems across Australia with a slight bias toward Western Australia, but we did not interview farmers uh, in other parts of Australia as well, not just farmers, we also interviewed um, uh, fertilizer advisors agronomists, as well as the CEOs and directors of industry bodies. So this it gave us a more complete picture of what goes on in the farming system. And these interviews were conducted by Fiona and me via, via telephone or Zoom, considering COVID. And um, during these interviews, we discussed um, current fertilizer practices, uh, fertilizer characteristics that are preferred by farmers or in, with, within an industry, current soil health management practices, soil improvers or compost that they may use, their appetite for sustainably banned products. So we discussed a lot about what they currently do, what they prefer, and basically their inclination. And we talked talk to them about our project as well. So we developed, using all those interviews, we developed a discrete choice experiment survey and the target for that survey is farmers from different production systems across Australia. And after the survey, we also conducted focus groups to sort of test the survey. And through our interviews and focus groups, we found, and these were very crucial for the survey, we found that of course, um, and it's no surprise that fertilizer use and application, soil management practices, the use of soil improvers, varied by individual farmer, by farming system, by the crop grown, by the region, by the soil, by water, even by regulations. So um, this made it very difficult to pin down one uh, consistent like current practice that could be applied across farmers, across production systems, which is probably no surprise. But we also did find that preferred fertilizer character, characteristics were the same. Mm -hmm. Some of, some of them were the same. And of course, price features right up there. Um, no surprises there. The nutrient composition of the fertilizers, particularly the macronutrients of nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, they were most important for the farmers. Secondary nutrients like calcium, magnesium, and sulfur were also important, not as much as uh, the NPK uh, content in a product. Then the fertilizer form was important to farmers, whether it was a hard granular fertilizer or whether it could be easily dissolved in water and applied to a fertigation system. 
that was very important. The consistency or the evenness of that nutrient blend was also very important for farmers. They wouldn't be selecting products where the nutrient blend kept wearing between bag to bag. And ease of handling and storage were also very important. But there were also other characteristics that were important to a little uh, subgroup of the farmers, not all of them. Uh, and these were characteristics that were currently unavailable, but which they were of interest. And these included um, uh, an interest in products that uh, supplied, that improved soil carbon or soil structure or water retention in the soil or natural products that contained beneficial microbes. So these were also products of interest. Now using these um, findings, and of course, consulting with um, Future Green as well on what their current trials were with regard to the PRAS products. What was the composition of uh, the PRAS products as well? And what they hoped would be um, potential uh, compositions of uh, the nutrients in the PRAS products. We designed our uh, choice experiment, which had the following attributes of interest, which were form, the fertilizer form was very important, whether it was granular or superfine particles and liquids. And we realized that form was uh, correlated with the rate of nutrient release. So we included a description of the rate of nutrient release with the form. So granular fertilizers were expected to be uh, fertilizers where there was a slow release of nutrients compared to those uh, compared to liquid fertilizers. Then the macronutrient um, content of a fertilizer was very important. Uh, we had three levels. We have three levels for it. Very low, uh, low and medium. And uh, the very low, the range of the macronutrients were between 0.5 and 0.9% on a weight by weight basis, which um, in like a hundred kg of fertilizer, it's just half a kg of nitrogen. So that's pretty low compared to commercial fertilizers where um, the macronutrient content can be 10% um, or higher. But given the nature of this product, uh, it is no surprise because values observed in early trials in of the PRAS products in the two early trials, as you can see, the macronutrient content is on the very low to low end. And we just had to be realistic that this product may be able to get up to a medium level of six to 10% of the macronutrients, but it may not get up to a high level of over 10% and compete with commercial fertilizers. Now the organic carbon in PRAS products is is expected to be a USP, is expected to be their selling point because they are pretty um, rich in organic carbon. And so we had a range for them from 0% to 60%. So that's um, still high, 60%. So weight is like 60 kgs and 100 kgs, which is still, it is quite high, but some commercial products do have that much organic carbon. And in trials, we found that uh, the organic carbon varied between what was an open average of 38 percent and price of course uh, was between 75 and 1800 and all these attributes were informed through literature review through the focus groups and also through consultation with future groups so they had to be realistic enough but as, as well as they had to allow for a flexibility of what uh, what the product could be developed into those percentages for the nutrients on the yes. day, are they a total of all three nutrients or is that like 60 to 10 percent each? Uh, each? Each. Each. Okay. It was going to get too crowded to right. So 6 to 10 percent of each of the nutrients, not the total nutrient content. And this is an example of a choice set that we have designed. And there is an opt out, so they do not have to purchase any product. And um, and this is how 
we designed it because the farmers are, I mean, they're not obligated to purchase the product. And because uh, their fertilizer use and application varies so much for crops for, and even sometimes for, for each year, it is very difficult to have the same baseline scenario for each farmer. It, it varies, so they just opt out of purchasing it. Um, now, there were a, a lot of challenges in developing this survey. And one of the uh, fundamental, one of the primary reasons is that the survey development is take, was taking place at the same time as the product development. So really when um, we were actually asked in our interviews, oh, how is this product gonna be? What are its characteristics? How, how does it perform in the field? We, we don't really have answers for it right now. And um, the, the problem is the purchasing is gonna be, uh, or the adoption of these uh, products is gonna be, is, is gonna hinge on their characteristics and their performance, but we don't have an answer right now. So that was a big challenge to actually be realistic at the same time as allow for that uh, flexibility of uh, saying that we are going to develop a product. So we need to keep that, that room for a scope for improvement. Um, another big challenge was whether to call the product um, a fertilizer or a soil improver, because I think in the beginning, um, when we interviewed farmers, we talked to them a lot about their commercial fertilizer use. But when we got to the stage of understanding our own product, we realized it was just not going to be able to com compete with the commercial synthetic fertilizers. At the most, it would compete with some organic fertilizers. Um, but because it has um, a lot of carbon in it, it, um, it is certainly going to be a product that helps improve the biophysical uh, uh, aspects of the uh, biophysical characteristics of the soil, like soil structure and water retention. So it's sort of like um, a fertilizer, but as well as, as a soil improver. And uh, another, in, another challenge was defining a base case, which, 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 which just got to be impossible for the choice experiment because there were so many sectors and so many fertilizer products that are being used by farmers that it's difficult for, for us to have a base case, which is why we ended up using an opt-out of purchasing product in our choice sets. And um, the next steps are gonna be pre-testing, which should take place next week, and after which we hope to administer the survey and analyze the data and draft the report. And I'll hand over to Marit for the rest. And I have two more slides to finish up. And um, so we're going full circle. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about the interesting, challenging aspects of this study. So firstly, and you know, I started doing interdisciplinary research in my, in my PhD, and I've always found it super interesting how different disciplines can't really communicate uh, that well. And the, it's actually been going really, it's actually been going remarkably well in this, in this uh, project. It's mostly been taxing on the program manager, which is myself, um, having to liaise with all these different disciplines and translating that all into the milestone report and understanding where everybody is at, because as you saw in the beginning, this research is very much a flow of activity flowing into the next of the, into the rest of the activities. And uh, because it's interdisciplinary, what one person needs is not necessarily um, understandable to the previous uh, link in the chain. And we, and we have had those issues all the way at the start of the production of the press. So that communication between the various actors that are involved with various dif disciplines and the role for the program manager is, is very important in these sort of big interdisciplinary projects. Just as an example, when I started this project, I just thought soil scientists are soil scientists. And then in the first three months, I, it was just like there's six different soil scientists and they all have different disciplines. And uh, one is, um, I was just like, okay, I thought you guys could just stand in for each other, but no, they all have their own expertise. And this thing cannot be done by that person. Which actually has been challenging as well because. Um, some of the soil scientists have 
dropped out of the project and then they leave this gap that the other ones can't fill because they have the specific microbiology background and I'm a, you know, a nutrient person, not a microbiology person. So that's going, well, it's going, it's going pretty well. We have regular meetings and actually have full team meetings so that everybody knows where each stage is up to. We've also had, um, oh, actually a part of the interdisciplinary uh, research challenge or really just the fun of interdisciplinary research is the different things you have to learn as you heard from Fiona and Vandana as well. Like Fiona and Audrey had to learn all about the waste management processes of all these different sectors and about aerobic versus anaerobic digestion and the various piggery um, systems that all produce different types of waste that would potentially feed into this BSS facility. There's even legal um, uh, legal aspects um, associated with the research because in every state that livestock waste is classified as a different type of waste and you can or cannot transport it so it's not just biophysically interdisciplinary, but also from a um, social and economic and, and regulatory perspective. And then Fanda and I had to learn about fertilizers applications and that um, there are just differences across sectors, but it also matters whether the fertilizer is going to be replacing something at seeding or something midway or something further down the, the after harvest. And uh, there's different, there's a time of application that's relevant as well. And um, so I hope everybody involved is learning a lot um, in the process. There's also lots of different industries involved. So we have the eggs, the sort of chicken producers, dairy, uh, meat processors, fish research and development corporation. And when we started, they all thought, right, we're going to find a solution for my fourth waste problem. And it's been a bit of a expectation management and, and a bit of pushing back from us as the team, um, trying to explain to them that no, we won't be able to provide you with a black soldier fly technology that you can put on your chicken farm to process that waste. Because what we have found is that actually they grow best through a mixture of waste inputs. And um, so just managing those various expectations. And then um, Fiona and Vandana already mentioned several times that the cyclical nature of the project where different activities feed into, uh, into each other has been interesting because we are measuring demand for the product to inform development of the product. But at the same time, we all already need to know what characteristics the product might have to inform that demand and situation. So to conclude what we're doing, we're generating this, this proof of concept of the black soldier fly farming technology, showing that that can be used to process waste. And maybe I should have had the numbers in there. Do you have them in mind? How much can they reduce? Is it like 70 ton to? Um, uh, as, as in the person, uh, percentage, I think at the most about 79%, but it depends on yeah. the organic waste stream. Yeah, so it can, produce, it can reduce the amount of waste by 70 to 80%. So if you have a ton of, of manure, uh, that can be reduced to a few hundred kilos. But uh, I think on average, uh, I think you said about you can get 50% degradation within 24 hours, but I think it depends on the waste stream. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's promising, right? Um, to potential, um, potentially use these black soldier flies to get rid of the, all the animal waste. And specifically with, um, or especially with new regulations coming in, where for example, dairy farmers uh, won't be able to just apply that waste on their fields anymore. Hopefully, and I'm saying hopefully, because we're not sure yet, we'll be able to develop this high quality um, fertilizer but um, we're now more leading towards a soil amendment. And we're even investigating whether it can be used as a feed um, if regulations change. Uh, at the moment, we're looking at, uh, in, into using the product as a fish feed product. And finally, we are actually now starting to talk to policymakers and the, those, who, those people who set 
legislation to overcome some of the regular barriers that exist to implementing uh, this product because in some states the BSF product might be classified as um, oh, what's it called it's not not toxic waste but it's like a it's like a waste it's a waste product that cannot be transported easily and that also um, is the wouldn't be able to use it on 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 food products for example or in or in home gardens so that's going to involve involve liaison with all these different regulatory bodies across Australia because each state has their own policy of course and I'll leave you there for questions stop sharing for a moment so that I can bring Fiona back up up um we have questions I'm not going to share this screen again and see if Fiona is back up. Yeah, there you go. I'm first going to ask if any of the students have any questions. <laughs> yeah, I guess one thing I was thinking about was you're talking about the psychology of kind of like disgust with the flies. I'm wondering, have you started looking into that with the interviews at all? Because to me, when I think of like the spectrum of disgust in my head, I think manure is so far ahead of flies anyway, that if flies are added into the equation, I don't care. But I'm wondering, <laughs> like, did farmers, was that brought up in the interviews at all when you're testing the survey? And like, what was the response in that? Can leave that to Fiona? Yep. I'll add to that. Yeah, um, good question. And yeah, it kind of took Audrey and I by surprise. But yeah, in one of the interviews that we did, and we asked the um, the discuss kind of question, and and the the um, I think he was he was an egg farmer, yeah, and he said, oh, absolutely, like just you know looking at any if I see maggots in manure, that just triggers like a whole you know range of issues for me. It's the the disgust thing as well in that looking at you know the thought of you know flies manure maggots but also the thought that there's something really wrong in my production system. So he in no way wanted anything to do with a fly facility, you know, anywhere near his property. So yeah, that was really interesting. I hadn't yet kind of thought about that, that a lot of these people, yeah, I mean, a lot of those farmers are pretty used to manure and waste, um, but yes, things like the thought of um, maggots eating waste and flies near waste that was a that was a really quite a repulsive thing so oh, oh, just so this um as you were sort of saying at the end there there's, there's a potentially a large external benefit from using this in that it, it minimizes waste that otherwise would have to be disposed of are you, does, the, does the project include attempting to value that, 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 that external benefit? No. No, okay. It might be helpful to have some sense of it in the conversation with policy makers. We do look at the, the non-market, I guess we are looking at the non-market values um, impacted by waste on, on farm, so that's part of the, the producer survey. Um, and we've decided to only characterize those rather than actually measure them yeah. because we there's just so much else it's going on but you know what um i can put it in uh, out as a master's project mm -hmm. <laughs> but i think that's a very good suggestion i think the challenge for me other than that it's very hard for me to identify a strong incentive here, a strong demand when you're just, because you didn't talk much on the cost side but different ways of Supposed to waste, but the material gain uh, doesn't look like this is a premium market or niche market that we have a premium, we have a high demand, or, because they're all alternatives. It might be hard to convince people, or oh, there's a case here, there's a story here. And the thing that I'm looking for is this there's a cost saving argument here. You need a incentive, a demand. I mean, maybe I've missed something. Uh, so, is this related to the producers? Anything you to to promote BSF product, 
Uh, it's because, because they, on anyway. the one hand, they need to reduce the amount of waste because they're, and they're already paying for their waste management, right? So this would just be an alternative. That's, that's what um, And saying. also that regulatory push. So that's why the industry is involved in this in the first place, because they're preparing for regulatory changes. So it's, it's, it's a new- The incentive. But I think- yeah. and, and To add, Fiona, we have to, um, if we have a one sentence answer because we need to wrap up. Just that, the, that just that we've um, included questions in the survey to, to gauge um, some of those intangible benefits that producers might have in terms of closing the loop um, for, you know, potential branding of products, um, sustainability added goals or whatever, that, that those sorts of questions are in there. I think it's definitely not just a cost, um, cost income equation in this case. How does it impact the methane cycle? So we're going to stop it there and we'll talk later. <laughs>